Hi, it's Multimeter repair time, or at least evaluating a returned BM786. Um, they don't fail all that often, still got the uh, protective, I don't know if they were using it with the uh, protective uh, film on it, or they just had it in the box and they put it back. Hands up if you do that, or hands up if you leave it in the comments, if you actually use your film, especially when it's like daggy like that, and it's really obvious. I've used stuff for, you know, donkey's years with the, with the film still on it, if it's like completely not obvious sometimes i've like used uh products and i go like i realized like five years later oh there's a film there uh, yeah flapping around in the breeze there yes the uh the bryman meters do fail um it's not a zero percent failure rate i'm not actually keeping figures on this i wish i did occasionally like i'll have to send out a new meter or whatever i don't bother like i don't offer a repair service i thought i'd have a look at this one uh because yeah it like it doesn't turn on apparently they assured me it's not the batteries it's Pressure on the battery pack? No. Uh, okay, um, let's crack her open and see what's what. And of course the 786 uses a quite unusual uh, battery pack. Pull out like the three, the vertical, three triple A's like that. That one's, that one's sitting out a bit, but that looks good. So it, it connects with one tab thing down there. So we've got a gold uh, flashed pad down there and a spring contact and that contacts that metal tab there so the spring contacts that and then there's that little tab over there so that tab's there that should work the springs in place let me um let me measure the voltage here well again 4.4 volts that should work i'm not seeing anything out of place there you can see that mark on the pcb there where that that has made contact so that's obviously touching something's failed in inside and it's written there nominal 4.5 volt battery negative on the pad and we're getting positive okay so the pad is the negative one. Oh yeah i can see that going down there yep that spring which is actually soldered to the pcb it's not a uh it's not just flapping around in the breeze sitting in that little holder there so i can uh hook a power supply under that hang on this is right up under the bench better make sure i've got it right <laughs> And they use a black terminal. I can't show you this. So I've got this National Instruments Virtual Bench uses a black terminal for the positive. It uses all black terminals. It's only the, like the ring around the back. You can't actually see it. You gotta, oh, it's just, anyway. So we should be able to see like a couple of milliamps, whatever the drawer is, if this actually works. Oh, no, no, it's cu what? current limit. What? It's dropping to 0.8. Something's going on there. Oh, yeah, I had it backwards. Oh, all right, that's embarrassing. So that's the reverse protection diode there kicking in. All right, it's positive on the pad and negative on there. Here we go. Uh, nothing. Can we see that LCD? No, no LCD. Oh, he's dead, Jim. Not seeing anything obvious. You wouldn't expect to, to take out the screen, I think, to get to processor. But the problem is you take out the screen you can't see if the thing's on or not. It's, you know, you have to rely on the current draw. So anyway, could it be a bad contact, like range switch contact? Because that's where the actual switch is in this thing to switch it on. So even though they they trust me to have the firmware and the firmware reprogramming tool, which they won't give to anyone else, but they won't trust me with the schematic. So I don't know, don't get it. Because, <laughs> you know, like what if I did want to have offer a repair service, you know? I mean, geez, I'd like to... You know, it's like for something like this, just doing a video, you know, I've signed an NDA with them. I wouldn't actually release it. There's our, there's the bottom. BTC is uh, Bryman. That's Bryman branded. So yeah, where's the um, protection? I can't remember. I'm going to have to look at my own teardown photos. So I do have teardown photos of this. There's no protection diode up there. Not on this side. But solder wise, everything's looking good around there. No wackers be easy if I had a schematic. Anyway, like next um, thing would be, I guess, remove the range switch. And because the range switch is, you know, you go for a mechanical fault. Anytime you've got a mechanical versus electrical, always go for the mechanical first. Don't assume it's electronic-y. And flip, it's the mechanism. It's got a little bit of grease in there. That goes around there like that. Now I've got to get it back in its original. <laughs> position but anyway contacts they look good I'm not seeing a problem there they look the correct height they're not worn they're not pushed in they haven't fallen out so contacts are good 
But no, on a multimeter, on something like this that has a mechanical power thing, you definitely want to suspect that, but that's shiny as a C3PO, look at that. So the next would be, you can see the switchware down here, but that looks good. So yeah, they've got labels around here. So which one's actually the power switch? There's usually one that goes like right around. Okay, so I'm gonna buzz this sucker out. 0.4 ohms. There you go, that is low. Jab it right up there, right up the clacker. Let's see if we can get the positive. 0.3, there you go. So that outer one is your positive, and that inner one, that's your negative. Okay, so it's getting through to the contacts. There's no contact, like you'd look for contamination on there as well. Like, you know, if it's customer return one, like you wouldn't rule out like so they spilled something on it or something like that. But there's nothing, nothing that's obvious. Quite happy with the looks of that. A few little normal wear marks from the range switch, but not a problem. I've, I've had that before. People have returned, not multimeters, but I've had people return stuff. And uh, yeah, and they've... Um, <laughs> <laughs> They've fiddled with it. Oh, I didn't fiddle with it, but uh, yeah, they have. So I can't see any reason to suspect the range switch is at fault there. So I guess now um, I need to put it back together, feed in a voltage, and then make sure it's getting to the processor. Because, you know, like the processor could be active, it could be drawing NAF all, but, you know, it could be getting there, and I don't know, the processor could be dead, the LCD driver could be dead. Anyway, I am going to rule out the range switch. That one there is the positive, did we say? And that inner one, and then the second inner ring is the negative. Switch, it doesn't look like to be switching any of the negative there, because the negative, I think this is the off position. I don't know, you know, how that actually lines up precisely. You can see the labels down here, off AC volts. If you try to decode these things, it's not going to be switching the negative. It's going to be switching the positive. You know, like this, we measured as the positive input. So it's switching it through to this one. So the contacts on the back of the switch, that one there, is, is doing the encode, uh, the encode, like the switching, between this and this. So this ground here is doing the sensing to tell the processor which switch position it's actually in. So that's what the negative is doing. So obviously it's, you know, it's pulled high, uh, probably inside the micro, and it's just, so that's how it reads the switch position. But the next, the next two rings, these two, are, well, at least this side of it, you can do other decoding on the other side, and that's why they have different ones on opposite sides like this, okay? So they do decoding in, you know, they do switch power switching and decoding. Anyway, there's a gap in there. So in the off position, well, it's off. It's disconnecting the power. But as soon as you move it from here to the next position, which is the AC volts, boom, it joins the two of these like that. And you can see it's got a little break in there. That's actually a break before make. So they're doing something. They're doing some break before make thing in there. So I don't know why. Was that doing a power on re? Is that the power on reset? Is that why they've got the make before break? Don't know. So if I had a schematic, be able to tell you. And uh, then we're going to have to measure the voltage on the processor somehow. All right, so I don't have the resolution on the uh, power supply here. I've only got that one milliamp, but occasionally it does flicker to one. So I've put the current meter, which is isolated from this thing in series. So let's see if this works. Let's go to 100 milliamp range. Yeah, there you go, 0.68 milliamps. So there's something there. But I'm pretty sure that's not the operational, <laughs> that is not the operational current. Okay, so I've got it in the case, and I think I've switched it to off. Yeah, there you go. I really need a sharp probe here instead of this banana plug. It's all right, I've got a current limit there. <laughs> I've got a nice uh, 30 milliamp current limit, as you can see up there on the uh, power supply. So I can use this as a probe to point to. It's the first time I've realized that. Okay, so it's off. And switch it on. Yeah, there you go, 0 0.68. Uh, is it getting to the processor? I don't know. That is the uh, multimeter chipset. That's not the um, processor. The processor's on the other side of this thing. So now, of course, if I was getting serious onto this, I would like solder a uh, little uh, wire onto there. Well, onto here. You don't want to contaminate that pad because um, that will uh, ruin your day when the press fit, um, uh, you know, contact, spring contact comes down on there like that but I'm too lazy for that and I'm a glutton for punishment so I'm just going to keep going damn it <laughs> now the good thing is is that I do have my power supply hooked up so it's hooked up to the multimeter as well so it's the common so it's already there as the uh, common 
So I could actually, you know, probe around stuff like this. Let's probe a cap there. There you go. Yeah, 670. Okay, well, 1.84 volts. 1.8 sounds like a voltage that you'd have. Once again, I don't, don't have the schematic, so, you know. So yeah, like we're getting something there. What's this one over here? Again, this is where the schematic would come in handy. That could be part of the, like the true RMS uh, thing or something, but yeah, there's not much doing over here. All the processor goodness is on the bottom side and it's under the LCD. Clearly, we've, uh, we're out of the realm of a like a simple problem, like a contact problem uh, with the battery pack, a range switch uh, problem. It's obviously there's power getting um, to the circuitry. Uh, there is actually a slight history of Bryman uh, processors actually just going tits up, um, like over a long period of time. Although I think this is a fairly recent order. I think it's like only a year, less than a year old or something like that. But in the uh, 235, which I've been selling for a long time, like seven or eight years now, I think, a, a few of those have actually just, you know, it's just failed. The, the main chip has uh, failed. And so, yeah, we're not sure, you know, is it silicon rot in the die or something like that? I'm not sure what the uh, deal is there, but um, yeah. So, you know, maybe something's died in there, but yeah, I mean, it could be like the uh, LCD driver chip. Yeah, we're, we're getting into serious troubleshooting territory now. All right, so I've soldered a wire on. I've removed the uh, LCD as well. Uh, so now we can access the other side of the board. So just check in here. So we can get this, uh, that's four and a half volts coming in. And our current is, ah, it auto ranges back. That's annoying every time. There you go, 0. 0.678 milliamps. Fortunately, like, you've got to be careful because it will time out. <laughs> you remember, auto, uh, multimeter has auto turn off. So maybe we should feed a continuous uh, voltage in, make it do something. I was gonna say that you could actually uh, put it to ohms mode, for example, put the probes in and see if it, and go to continuity mode and see if it can go through. And uh, even though you don't know what mode you're in, go through and see if it buzzes. But uh, yeah, 0. 0.68, 0. 0.6 milliamps is not right. So anyway, we can now flip that over. I probably should have put, <laughs> I'm just gonna ruin that spring, aren't I? So yeah, this goes over to the uh, keypad, that one and that there. So in something like the ground spring here, which goes to the, it's not the battery negative, it's actually the uh, guard ground of the circuit, which goes, to, that spring goes to the uh, shielding in the back of the case. That, you don't expect that to be ground. So that's at some voltage there. Um, I don't know whether or not that's correct. Once again, don't have a schematic, so don't know. But I do know it's not zero, so that's good. So, that, you know, there's, there's voltage going on in here. So it's scope time now. Unfortunately, um, I don't have this machine set up to view the scope, like showing both at once. I haven't got my ATEM set up for that. Right, so I'll just probe the rail there, uh, the battery. There you go, four and a half. Okay, well, let's see if we've got any oscillation on our clock, shall we? Oh, there's your problem. Uh, yeah, no clock. Using times 10 probe, so we're not loading that down too much, but yeah. Um, oh, what's, oh no, I thought that was a little blowhole there for a second, <laughs> no. So yeah, we're getting no, no clock on our processor, so that's a problem. Just occurred to me, what I could actually do is hook this up to the uh, programmer and see if the, like, and power it through the programmer. Is that a short? Is that a short on a pin? No, this looks like a bit of plastic or, no, that's it, that's, no, that's a bit of fluxy. That's not going to stop the processor working though. Okay, what I'm going to do is probe these caps here. So if I probe those, you can see that there's not much happening there, either side of those caps, right? We're getting something little there. I expect that to be bulk decoupling for the chip here. I mean, you know, this, this looks for all the world like, you know, power input pins, right? So it seems like the processor is not getting it's not getting voltage. We've got a regulator over here. Is that it? Let me probe. Ah, there. Okay, that's four and a half. You can't see that, but that is uh, the four and a half volts. Okay, so the four and a half volts going in. That'd be the output. Ah, I can, you can't see that. There you go. Um, yeah, that's uh, the 3.3. So we're getting our 3.3 volts there. Is there anything like 3.3 volts happening on the micro? There doesn't seem to be. So why? The switch position is on. Um, well, we know that because it switches it through to the regulator. See, here's where it'd be like super handy to have the schematic. Just saying, Bryman, 
Anyway, we are on the right track. I think I've got a solder wire in there. I don't like that. Turns out that's actually a 3.5 volt rail. There you go. But it doesn't seem like any of that is getting to the processor. I know there are different grounds in here for like the analog subsystem and things, but the uh, but the actual processor um, should just be a regular 3.3 volt or whatever, 3.5 in this case maybe, uh, processor. It should be sharing that ground. Like even if I use another multimeter, which you can't see here, cap there, like I'm getting I'm getting 0.13 volts. No, 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 no. That's wrong. Now this is interesting. On the other side here, we've got two transistors, Q19 and Q18. And here's our 3.3, our 3.5 volts, okay? It ain't coming out. So it's got a 10k pull-up, unless there's a, no, there's no, there's no via jumping down to the other side. It goes through a 10k resistor. What is that doing? Um, it's just power, like it's a big fat trace too, as if like it's a power trace rather than a signal trace, but it goes nowhere um, except through this 10k resistor. Uh, yeah, power switching, going to the processor. Look, that, uh, I've had a little, little rework there. That is not a reflow. Somebody used some excess solder there. I assume that's from the factory and the, uh, <laughs> the customer hasn't, uh, done that but you never know but yeah now we're getting into some is interesting electronics debugging at least all right so i hooked up the uh programmer to this thing i actually programmed a good uh unit with the latest uh, firmware to make sure everything was working fine then i plugged it into this one and it doesn't work so the processor under here um this is it's just not detecting it uh the programmer doesn't detect it and this thing you program in the off the switch off position so it actually supplies external power to here so it bypasses any other switching that's um, happening. So yeah, if it can't read the processor, then yeah, something's wrong. But that doesn't explain why we're getting no voltage to the processor on uh, when we switch this thing on since. Even if the processor was dead somehow, you know, the silicon just doesn't work, um, then it'll, you'd at least get voltage to it. Found something that can actually uh, switch this. <laughs> Let's probe it here like this. And if I switch on, you can see that it switches through to there. So yeah, it's actually, um, there, there, there'd be a cap there. It's gonna slowly discharge. Yeah, so that it, it's doing the business, right? So why does that power not get through to the main processor seemingly? Um, gonna have to tracey trace. Yeah, so the output of that regulator, it drops through here. It doesn't go anywhere else. And then through a zero ohm resistor to here, right? So that's it, that looks like that's the extent of the path. Hang on, we are getting our three and a half volts there. Okay, so that's going through to here. So what I thought was a, well, this could be like a star ground, okay, because you don't know, like, because the voltage rails inside these multimeters are, they're not floating is not the correct term, but they're shifted and they're, you know, they're all over the shop. So unless we had the schematic, um, hard to see, but basically that transistor is fine, right? So we have the power coming in here where it goes through a zero ohm resistor. It goes into this transistor and it comes out this transistor here. So that's fine, right? So we're getting three and a half volts going over here, powering everything that, that goes over to here. Oh, no, see that, that must be a different ground. Okay. So that's why we're because I'm using the common ground at the moment. I'm not using two probes to probe a differential. Hang on, that's just switched off. Did I, what, what happened there? Okay, switch on. Four and a half volts goes through over to here. Three and a half volts out of the regulator. Okay, it drops down. There's a whole bunch of vias there. It drops down here, over to here, and then switches through Oh, no. Now it doesn't. It did before. You saw it. What the? What's wrong with that little sucker down there? Soldering wise, it looks fine. Oh, I swear, I'm not going nuts, right? <laughs> I wish I could replay the video right here in front of me. I'm sure that was switching it through. You saw that before. Okay, well, this is starting to get very silly. Um, this is where I have to start like almost reverse engineering and looking up part numbers and stuff like that. So what I've done is I've actually uh, hooked this up to the uh, programmer here and uh, I can't show you that for confidentiality reasons, but um, it doesn't detect 
the chip. So the interesting thing about this is that you program it in off mode. So it actually bypasses all the power. It supplies power through the connection interface here, which is this little pin header over here. It doesn't detect the chip. So even bypassing this uh, regulator here, which uh, we've determined uh, switches on, in when you actually switch the meter on, it switches that, but also because uh, multimeters have power off functionality, that's clearly what, I believe that's what these transistors down here are doing. This is the auto off uh, functionality. So this is like a processor latch thing. Now we've seen that it, uh, when we did have it actually latch power on the output here, but then it didn't later on. So I, I don't know what's going on there, maybe, I don't know, processors half booting up and latching on and then dying? I, I got no idea, but obviously the programmer is not being detected. So there's something wrong with, at least when you bypass it, like everything else taken out of the equation from the multimeter circuit, this thing is not being detected when you plug into the programmer header. There's just no point chasing a red herring down a rabbit hole there um, if we can't get this thing to... to <laughs> detect when we at least plug it in here. So it could be the micro dead, could be some other part of the circuit that's being used by this external power thing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plug in the external power here and I'm going to work from there to see if we actually get power on this chip. Because I think these two have to be the power pin. Now here's another interesting thing. I supposedly know the exact type of this microcontroller. I downloaded the PDF data sheet for it it's not available in a 48-pin LQFP here. Um, it's just not. It, it's just not available now. They do have a lesser range in a 48, uh, like a slightly different variant in a 48-pin uh, job, but the pinouts don't match at all. So, and of course, look, like we've got. A decoupling cap here, like huge big vias, like this is ground, okay? Like this is power, okay? And like a huge tans here, right? This has to, these two have to be the power pin. It doesn't match the data sheet at all. So I think they've got some custom pin variant of that. The manufacturer's made it for them, which they'll do if you've, you know, significant enough customer, no worries. What I've done is just put a text mark there so I know exactly where the off uh, position is. I'm not going to get confused. So that is definitely off. I can tell you that negative is over this side over here. 131 millivolts. That's what we're getting before, right? That is not working. That is not, like, that's got to be a power rail, right? And look at this pin over here, right? That is going through an inductor. Like, that's got to be, like, a power rail. Doesn't matter if we get the probes around the other way. Right? Probe between there and there, there and there. Like, you know, like some, there's got to be a power rail in here somewhere. Right? <laughs> Even if you just, you have no clue. You just randomly probe around at large traces with decoupling caps and large number of vias and stuff. Right? It, there's just, there's, not, there's nothing. And I think the second one here, well, the second one here is red. There you go, 3.2 volts. So we're getting our voltage in there. But once again, this is over this part of the circuit, so is it... It's nowhere near that power-up thing, so... I don't know, we're, we're just, it's not getting through. There could be like a diode or in thing or something that activates that uh, power-on latching circuit and bypasses that somehow. There could be something tricky going on there, um, and it's just not getting through. So, you know, I wouldn't rule out that uh, transistor pair that we've got there. That might be a cause in an issue in both the regular power on function via the switch and also via the external programmer as well. <laughs> That'd be just my luck, wouldn't it, bloody Murphy? Right, so what I can say now is that the micro, you know, you can't say the micro is just, oh, the micro is faulty, let's just replace the micro. You can't do that. There's no voltage going to it. So, of course, it's not going to do anything. Of course, we're not going to get a clock like we couldn't measure before. Now I've got to decide whether or not it's better to uh, trace the power here via the range switch or and the battery or via the external programming header here. I don't know, I'm tempted to think the programming header, but Murphy will ensure whichever way I pick, it's going to make it harder. But ultimately I think either way is going to lead to the same fault. Now it's not like the uh, processor or some other part like a shorted cap or something like that is shorting down the rail because we're measuring 3.2 volts 
on that rail, which I, you know, <laughs> if that 3.2 volts is not getting to the processor in any way, then we need to know why. Um, that That is what we need to fix here. So let's start off by doing a sanity check of what what I know is the system, well, <laughs> the initial system ground over here and the ground over on the thing, yep, it's the same ground. So let's go from here and find out which pins is this one over here. Once again, that's also ground. That's what I suspected, right? It's the negative of the cap there. It's right, everything's hunky-dory. Don't know why that cap's missing over there, right? But all this, all this stuff here, right, this is ground. So this is definitely the ground pin. This looks like a power pin because it's coming through an inductor. You usually would have the inductors in the positive uh, rail. So we've definitely got our correct ground pin, but we're getting nothing come in from over here and of course, this is our 3.2 volt power pin, right? We're getting nothing. So obviously, you know, we're not going to have like a PCB break or something like that. That's like the most, it's, it's not impossible, but it's the most unlikely scenario, right? So I'd say that, uh, yeah, there's some sort of um, power latching, switching circuit. And I don't think that the battery input is going to be connected to here. No, and it's not. So what we can safely do now, I think, is plug in, because I, you don't want to be probing with two probes, so I'm going to plug in the ground, and I'm going to reconnect the ground over to here, so that I am hooked on, so now I can just probe with a single probe and go around because you know it's, it's going to be a common ground for the processor if you're trying to debug the multimeter chip which is the one on the other side that's when all bets are off that's when all the grounds are different and everything else right and you're going to come a guts if you're trying to do that but this is just the processor right the ground is connected through to the battery and through to there and through to the processor no worries but the analog circuitry just be aware very different scenario Okay, so let's check again. We have 3.3 volts. What was that 3.2 before? Anyway, we have three, yeah, 3.3 volts coming in. Right, so where is that pin going? I'm going to have to flip it over. Actually, I will trace this. Ah, oh, there we go. There we go. It's that fatty. It's that fatty running off there. It's running to that resistor there, is it? Is that a zero ohm resistor? It is a zero ohm resistor, so it's a jumper. Okay, so. Yeah, we've got this fatty trace going off here, off here, it's going down here. Okay, hello, there we go, 4.5 volt bat, but it's not connected through to the battery, which is 2.2, that's interesting, okay? So it comes over to here, boop, 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 and it jumps up, uh, is, it, is it that via there? Yeah, there it is, okay? So it's jumping up over there, okay? So we've got two inputs here, aha! Uh -huh. This is now starting to make sense from a, a physical layout point of view. Here's our battery input here, okay? And here is our input for our uh, external programmer, right? So we've got both. And we can see that buggering off on the other side there. flippity doo -da. What was it? This one here? Ah, oh, it's going on an internal layer. Bugger it. But yeah, it's around here. There's something. I reckon there's something in that power latching circuit. There's got to be. That's the only thing that, make it, that makes sense. Aha, uh -huh. once again, there it is. Our 3.3 volt going into there, right? And it's not, and it's not coming out. Exactly the same thing is going on here. Exactly the same thing. You remember how it switched through before? So from there to there, that's how it was uh, switching. And this is just the uh, base slash gate here. Maybe it's that puppy. I think this is part of the latching circuit, but I think this is the main one that switches the power through to here. So I'm suspecting that little bad boy, Q18. So we need a, need a partner, we need a definitive part number on that. Yeah, there you go, you get that. That is B0329. Okay, so this is some form of soft latch power circuit. Where have we seen this before? Uh, check it out here in my uh, extremely popular uh, soft latch power circuit video. We have a uh, P-channel MOSFET with an uh, N channel bipolar pulling uh, the gate down to ground. And uh, you can have a third transistor over there to do the latching function and stuff like that. But anyway, um, in that particular case, we'd have like the micro 
like doing that. Yeah, this is the exact same arrangement here. Now, I couldn't find any info on this B0329, but I think that is a P-channel MOSFET because it matches the pinout for a P-channel MOSFET. So we've got a voltage coming in here to the source, and then we've got the uh, pull-up resistor, which goes through two of these like that, and then we've got this would be an N, an N channel bipolar transistor, and that is just going to pull that down to ground so and which is our ground is here yep it does <laughs> so there you go so that is ground so it's just simply latching that uh down to ground no worries i'm suspecting that because the bipolar transistors are more rugged than mosfets if, if you're going to have a transistor fail out of these two your money should be on the mosfet so i'm just going to go to my mosfet kit find a p-channel mosfet and i'm just going to replace that because it takes two seconds wiggle 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 yeah come on you can do it Go on, ski. Okay, what I've got is a uh, BSS84. It's a small signal uh, P-channel MOSFET. Should do the business. Got our 3.3 volts coming in here. Do we get our 3.3? No, we've come a gutsa. That ain't it, folks. Wah, 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 wah. You see, now a problem here is that that transistor, of course, it's not going to switch on because that... Like, that is not grounded, so I should have actually checked that before. <laughs> Maybe I was wrong. Maybe the uh, N channel. Now, the interesting thing is, if this was a, an NPN, a functional NPN bipolar, we should be able to measure the diode drop on the gate there, the base emitter, because this is the emitter, this is the base, and we ain't measuring anything there. That's either not a, a bipolar transistor or it's um, buggered. So that's an A603G, and I can't find, once again, can't find any information on 0603G. Now, what I've done is I've um, compared to another unit, because I have one. Sure enough, there's no um, NPN uh, junction in there, so this is not a bipolar. I think this is a MOSFET. Get the multimeter back out. So what we expect is actually, I've got the uh, external power plugged in, we expect... A positive signal on there and I've compared that with a good unit and yeah we get 3.3 volts there so the micros obviously like you know doing that and switching that on so but it's not doing that so I don't know that's going to be hard driven so we can't just short it out because then we'd be shorting out the output uh, gate but we could actually remove that resistor there and actually um, you know connect that to the input and that would latch on the circuit or of course you know we could just bypass the main uh, switching MOSFET here um, switching that through but yeah um, I've, I've confirmed on a good unit that that's what that does you get a 3.3 volt signal on there that turns on this N channel uh, jobby here which then latches and pulls on the P channel here and switches the power through to here and I've, I've confirmed that so that's that's definitely what's going on so it could still be a dead micro the boot code in the micro is like putting that high somehow so you'd have to follow the money there but once again we could have saved three quarters of our time here if we actually had the schematic okay at this point i'm done screwing around with this thing i'm going to short out the power transistor here and so i've removed that one i put in i'm just going to short there to there and that will permanently switch on the power to this thing and we'll see if the damn thing works just going to measure the voltage here nah see we still get nothing out of there so it's not latching that on let me try my uh See if it can connect to the chip on my programmer here. Chip ID from IC. No, it's got no. I'm getting nothing. Measure the voltage between there and there. And that should be our 3.3 volts. There it is. Let's see if we get that over here. 1.77. Let me compare a good unit. Okay, so here is a good unit in uh, programming mode. You can see it's got the dashes across here. It switched the micro on. Uh, it's in off position, but we're powering it uh, through here. And 3.3. No, 1.6. There to there is 3.3. Back to the bad board here. 3.25. Okay, right. So we've got the same conditions. So the chip, let's just assume that's getting through to there, right? So the chip is being powered, okay? And we're getting nothing on the programmer. Um, so whereas the programmer tells me the chip ID and it, it works on the good board and doesn't work on this one. So the only other reason I can think of that this micro is uh, not working apart from it failing is we go back to the mechanical side of things and a crystal. Um, there. 
it was there. I decided to remove the uh, crystal because foes in uh, crystals are a thing. So they're a mechanical uh, part. And unfortunately, I lifted the pad. This is a real dog to get off. I could not get this off properly with either hot air or with uh, dual soldering irons. It just lifted the whole pad off so unfortunately um yeah that's a bit of a fail you can see the caps are on the uh, bottom here and you can see they they that they've got a uh, 10 meg resistor across there so unfortunately that's so i'm gonna have to wire a mod wire into there around to there the uh 121 gw actually has the same except it's a uh, through hole and one of them is 4.9152 i could just bodge that in just to try it and uh yeah she'll be right there we go and you've got to ask yourself, do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Those two holes there? Oh, no! Then I might be able to solder the crystal down to those two vias, but, eh, whatever. Have well, I got the right gauge wire? Yes, I do. Look at that. Ah, oh, beauty. All right, we'll just push that out of the way. And I can just solder the crystal onto what's remaining of, the, of that pad and that one. All right, we have a crystal bodged in there. Um, I don't know what pad that's... Well, it's not even touching that pad, I don't think, or it might be slightly, but that's just the case. If it's ground, hey, if not, eh, it probably doesn't matter. It'll oscillate. Plug our programming header back in. Nope, still not reading the ID. Still not reading the chip ID. Oh, so much for that. That was worth a try. It's oscillatoring. Maybe there was nothing wrong with that crystal at all. And yeah, the reason it wasn't oscillating before is because it wasn't getting power. Damn. I should have actually um, re-checked the oscillator when we discovered that there was no power to the chip. I should have rechecked it after, after we forced the power on. Yeah, I just butchered that board for no reason. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you. Oops. So yeah, I had no trouble. Like, I thought it'd be easy to get that crystal out, but it, it wasn't. The adhesive on the bottom of the pad just gave away, and boom, once that happens, you know, it's like, eh, you can repair stuff like that. I could get some, like, adhesive uh, copper, and I could actually repair that uh, pad, perhaps, and, you know, so if I was to do a proper uh, repair on this, that's what I'd... So yeah, you can see there, that is oscillating just fine and dandy. It's not talking to the programmer, so I can only presume, yeah, the chip is dead, the internal oscillator is working, but something else has died. That's the only conclusion I can come to now. Please leave your uh, thoughts and comments uh, down below. I'm going to leave it at that. Sorry, you know, I know a lot of people don't li like the unhappy ending, but there are a lot of people who think the journey is what matters and this is a quite a decent little journey we went on here this sort of stuff doesn't take me long by the way if i'm not shooting a video it, it doesn't take me this long i'm not yapping on i don't have a spare chip i could you know even if i like i would have to rip one off another board and i don't have a junked uh, 786 uh, i could get one from bryman but then even if i did that would prove that it was the chip but uh, then it would lose its calibration values because I don't believe there's an external e square problem in here. I think it's all internal. It's in the protected mode of the chip, the calibration values. So you can re update the firmware and you don't reset the calibration values. But if you physically change the chip, yeah, um, you're going to lose some of the uh, calibration values. It might still be basically, you know, it might still be within spec, but it's not going to be eh, 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 tweaked. I, I think we've come down to the micro, but if you've got a better guess, I could go and trace the signals for the programmer and stuff like that, but oh geez, now we're getting fancy pantsy. I don't even know the pinout. Anyway, I'm going to leave that as a part one. So if you enjoyed that troubleshooting journey, give it a big a thumbs up. And as always, uh, discuss it down below and over on the EV blog forum. And uh, thank you to all my patrons as well. I uh, put the videos up first on uh, the Patreon account. Um, in fact, I put this one up as a partial one last night like a 30 minute edit um original edit never intended to repair it i just thought you know i, I just started down the rabbit hole thought it might be interesting and easy to see why it failed and i think yeah i think the micro has just died and then it doesn't latch on yeah we got carried away uh replacing a few parts we shouldn't have uh, there but that's all part of you know troubleshooting with hindsight yeah i you know i goofed a few things i'm trying to shoot a video at the same time and you know trying to yeah so that might have distracted me but yeah i shouldn't have butchered that crystal that was a bit mean Anyway, you can also uh, catch some exclusive videos which aren't on the YouTubes. Uh, they're over on my Odyssey channel. And I've got a new product 
right outside the door there. There's a whole bunch of new products um, that I'll um, do an unboxing of that. And I will, because I haven't seen it yet, I'll do an unboxing of that. I'll whack it on my Odyssey channel as an exclusive. So check that out if you want. Anyway, catch you next time. Thank <laughs> you.